be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you hear the word church, what kind of picture comes to mind? Do you think of this church, the space that we're in, or the structure outside? Or do you picture the people who gather to worship here? That's us right now, you and me. I think the latter is the better way to picture the word church, because the Bible uses that word to refer to believers rather than a building. Okay, if you agree with me, and we conclude that that is the case of the definition of the word church, the gathering of believers, how would you draw a picture of that gathering? Would you draw people arm in arm with big smiles on their faces, you know, one big happy family? Or would you draw the people in groups here and there, each with their arms folded, glaring at one another, at least looking suspiciously? at the other groups. Oh, my dear friends, sadly, that latter picture is often the reality, isn't it, when it comes to Christian congregations. But it doesn't have to be that way. Not when we come to appreciate God's eye view of the church that the Apostle Paul gives us as we continue our study in Paul's letter to the book of Ephesians. Paul begins this text in chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Paul begins our text with encouragement. Let me read again verses 1 to 6. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. How encouraging. How encouraging for us as the church. Did you notice as I uh, read that from Esther's uh, first reading of it for us this morning, did you notice how Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity instead of make every effort to be unified? The church, including our congregation here, is already unified. That shouldn't surprise us Not when we hear Paul remind us that there is only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. So although we were all baptized at different times and perhaps in different places, it's the same baptism that we received. And so the result is the same. We were each washed clean of our sins and given the gift of the Spirit, the one Holy Spirit who leads us in the one faith that Jesus is the one Savior. Paul teaches us that while unity in the church is a gift, it's also a task. It's something we need to keep working at and maintaining because Satan keeps trying to destroy the unity that we're trying to build together. And he uses, unfortunately, our own selfishness to accomplish the breaking up of that unity. That's why I think Paul wrote in verses 2 and 3 of Ephesians 4, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, how? 
through the bond of peace. Friends, the key to maintaining unity is humility. And note how Paul urges us to be completely humble and gentle. Not just humble and gentle most of the time, or, or, or when it suits our own needs. Paul understands that. That's why he also urges us to bear with others in love. Jesus modeled what it means to bear with others in love when he prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus could have justly cursed those who were crucifying and mocking him. Instead, he took the abuse, praying that these soldiers and others would see the errors of their way. And if they didn't, well, Jesus would leave that to his heavenly Father to sort out. You see, Jesus hadn't come to judge the world, not on his first coming. He had come to save the world. Nor have we been sent to judge the world. We have been sent to save it by spreading the message of Jesus and by modeling his patient love. Of course, bearing with others in love doesn't mean that we will never point out when others have hurt us. But bearing with them means that we will also let them explain themselves since it could be that we might have misunderstood their words or their actions. But if it becomes clear that their words and actions towards us were indeed mean-spirited, we will simply urge them to repent. But our purpose here is not to rub their faces in their sins. Rather, we also want to announce to them that Jesus paid the price for that sin. And that God has removed it from his sight, just as we have removed the sin from our sight too, for Jesus' sake, and for the purpose of maintaining unity in the church. Thankfully, we don't have to maintain this unity on our own. Paul went on to write in verses 7 and 8, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Paul is quoting here Psalm 68, which serves as a prophecy of Jesus' coming to earth to win our salvation. The translation of the Hebrew Psalm 68 into Greek leaves us with some interesting wording. It literally says this, that Jesus came and took captivity captive. What was it that had captured us? Satan, sin, death, hell. But Jesus in turn came to capture them. As Martin Luther once put it so well, Jesus came to exterminate my death. He came to damn my hell. Once Jesus accomplished that through his death and resurrection, he ascended into heaven. Psalm 68 refers to that triumphal ascension, and it compares Jesus to a conquering king returning home with all the spoils of war. But Jesus didn't keep those spoils for himself. Rather, he shares them with the church. That's why Paul wrote in verses 11, 12, and 13 of chapter 4 this. So Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach, here's the word again, unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Jesus' gifts to the church are spiritual leaders, both ordained and lay, whose job it is is to equip us 
the saints. We are all saints. So that we can continue to maintain the unity of the church. And what are the tools that are used to help maintain the unity of the church? God's word. God's word. Paul describes the positive effect the word has on believers who continue to study it and apply it to their lives day by day. Look what Paul says in the final verses, beginning at 14 to 16. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. To build each other up in love. That's our goal as members of the church. In fact, you could say that every Christian is a bodybuilder. That is, every Christian's goal is to build up other Christians. And by doing so, we will build up the body of Christ, the church. So then why is it that we often act more like cast members of the reality show Survivor than members of Jesus' body? Since only one contestant on that show will get the prize, the participants are at each other's throats from day one. If they forge friendships, it's only because they think the other person can be useful for a time. Eventually, these alliances will dissolve and bitterness will ensue as each strives to step on the other to get ahead. Friends, the fact is we are survivors. We are survivors of a fallen world desperately making our way to our home in heaven, like survivors of a shipwreck who have managed to pile into the same lifeboat. I imagine, I've never been shipwrecked, but I imagine that survivors on a lifeboat get sick of each other after a few days. But what are they going to do? Jump overboard and swim for it? Not if there's no land or ship in sight. Instead, they will just have to bear with each other and learn to work together, or they'll never reach their goal of arriving safely home. So the question that we as members of the church want to keep asking ourselves is this. What can I do? to ensure that those who have gathered here in this lifeboat that we call St. Paul's can make it to heaven? How can I help my family and my fellow members stay close to Jesus? One thing we'll want to do is to bear with each other in love. Unity. It's what the world desperately seeks. But we Christians already have it. Why wait for heaven to enjoy it? By being completely humble and gentle and patiently bearing with each other in love, we can enjoy the benefits right here and now. And we'll do this with the help of the one Lord, who sent his one son to save us, and now through his one spirit has unified us.